Hi, this is Caillou's dad, Boris, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I have you here with us, thank you for joining. As always, I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. Who are you today? Okay, squish, squish, squish. How are you, my friend? Doing good, Jake. Our other co-host, uh, Matt Bingle, he will uh, try to join later on. He's just running a little bit late, but no worries, he will try and make it soon. Um, and our guest for today, we're very happy. Um, he is an Australian voice actor. Um, he has lent his voice to uh, Popeye, uh, Homer Simpson. He narrated the George of the Jungle movies. He worked on the Blinky Bill franchise, a whole bunch of other things that we'll touch base on later on. And here he is, Keith Scott. Keith, happy to have you here. How are you? It's great to be here, uh, chaps. And uh, thank you so much for asking me. All the way from down under in Australia. <laughs> Our pleasure. pleasure. Yes. Right. Yes. So to start this off, so for those who don't know you, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and the type of work that you do? Yeah, really. Uh, 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 you know, all my life, uh, I guess, for like I'm, I'm an old guy, obviously. So uh, like for 45 years, I was doing most of my work based in where uh, where I was born and live in Australia. But uh, it was always um, in the animated cartoon field. And when I was like 18 years of age, um, it was like um, I had a, a, an angel hover over me and hit me with the wand because uh, William Hanna from Hanna-Barbera opened a uh, a branch of his studio in Sydney, Australia. And uh, and I, you know, uh, had already written to his chief uh, voice man, the late uh, Doss Butler, who I'm sure you know about. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the voice of um, Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound and all of those great old Hanna-Barbera characters. And uh, so I took that letter in to, to meet Bill Hanna. And um, the upshot of it was that he knew that I was really interested in, um, you know, being the next generation of uh, cartoon voice actor. And uh, he gave me a job around this animation studio when I was, you know, in my late teens just to learn the whole business. And uh, it was um, it was just one thing after another after that. It was like uh, at the same time I'd written to Doss Butler I'd written to June Foray, you know, the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel and um, uh, and uh, all the other Jay Ward cartoons. And she had put me on to a guy in uh, Southern California uh, who really was a, just like a year younger than me named Corey Burton, who you may have heard of, who's become oh, yeah. a, a wonderful yeah, voice very, actor, yeah great voice actor and he and i um in those way way before the uh, modern technology uh we we ended up being um snail mail friends you know <laughs> oh, nice. um, yeah and uh and became you know very um we i think we were the biggest j ward productions fans in the world in those days and uh um and of course again it's uh, to to your generation it must seem a bit quaint to think back that there was only four tv channels in both countries you know and uh, now there's you know hundreds and hundreds, but uh, um, you know we uh, we became very uh, erudite friends about all of this uh, stuff. And of course, he was still in high school, and I just left high school, so uh, we were uh, really possibly I don't know if this is a fact, but we were possibly the first of that generation who wanted to be the next Mel Blanc. June, June for Ados Butler type voice actors, and um, and the funny thing was that all these uh, great actors back in those days, who were who are now the uh, the old time legends, um, you know, I can remember my mother saying, "Oh, these people will never have time. They're too busy to even answer your letter." And every one of them couldn't have been better. You know, they 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 were enthusiastic about you know meeting us in person, and uh, and so it's almost like they could sense that we were so knowledgeable about what they did that uh, we were definitely going to take over once they retired or passed away, you know? So that was, right. that was my background, you know? And, and, um, and 
Fortunately, when Bill Hanna in in Sydney before he left uh, to go back to the uh, back to Hollywood, he gave me a reference letter, and because his name carried such weight in the industry, um, it got me an agent in Sydney straight away. So from about the age of nineteen twenty, I was doing, starting to be a professional cartoon voice actor and just a voiceover guy doing radio and television commercials, and at the same time, because I did all these impersonation voices. Uh, I also had like it was sort of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There was two sides of me. One one side did all these voiceover recordings, and the other side was doing this stand up impressionist thing uh, on stages uh, in clubs every weekend, um, doing all the you know the the old movie stars and political voices and all of that on stage. Sort of like uh, oh, who would you say, um, Rich Little or John Biner or people like that? You know who. Uh, I guess these days they've kind of more been replaced by um, people on the um, on YouTube and that who are doing their own videos and uh, younger mimics doing well. I suppose there's still characters like that who are known by every generation, like Trump and Biden and people like that. So back in the day when I started out, I was doing uh, Richard Nixon and uh, <laughs> characters like that. So it's just um, just been a long career with all of these um, zany voices and things and. Uh, that really is my background, and it's it's been it was so busy for a long time because it's uh, I'm I'm rapidly approaching retirement age now, but uh, it really was a, like a forty five year career of doing all this stuff, and I finally got to you know some sort of prominence internationally when uh, the people who did the Bullwinkle and all of those cartoons began dying just from old age, you know, and uh, by then their family knew about me and Corey Burton and. Uh, we both ended up being, I think, the first ever what they now call voice matchers. We we replaced the originals and tried to be as accurate and authentic as we could. And um, uh, and so, you know, I couldn't believe it, but um, I ended up uh, being the official American voice of Bullwinkle for 20 years. And uh, that was like a, a childhood dream come true because that was that was one of those cult TV shows that I I just loved when I was a kid. Oh, it was yeah. kind of The Simpsons, yeah, but definitely The Simpsons of its day. In fact, it was it was actually really uh, like thirty years too early for the um, type of humor that that is valid today because it was doing that sort of crazy, irreverent sort of stuff way back when most cartoons were just cats chasing mice. You know, here's here's Rocky and Bullwinkle talking about congress in washington and the cold war and all of that so uh you can imagine what they were doing with, with today's headlines <laughs> that's right so yeah that's that's my and of course you know i don't know whether you know about the blinky bill you mentioned that that but but that was um a lot of local animation here that before before the age of the internet um wasn't really known but now i think uh you know everything that's ever been made will end up on youtube one day um, right yeah yeah <laughs> It's Definitely. just uh, been an amazing um, uh, advent of technology. And in fact, it helps people like me. Uh, years ago, we used to have to make a recording and carry it with us to prove to some advertising director that we could do a, an impersonation of Vincent Price or one of these actors. And now you just dial up YouTube in the studio and there's a clip and you can just listen to it and get a bit of reference in your headphones and and uh, make sure it's authentic. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just sort of happily embracing all of these new... Um, technological advances but uh yeah that that's my story at uh, at great length <laughs> that sort of uh, filled you in as to what i do nice awesome so i'm mm -hmm. kind of curious do you remember your very first professional voiceover job yeah it was actually for uh hannah barbera in australia they were promoting the fact that they'd set up this studio and uh and he said you know you, you want to do voices um he said, uh, "We've got a little animated thing to sell our own wares to the to this country, and uh, it was a little, uh, you know, character um, bouncing on screen with this little high pitched voice, and suddenly morphing into a, a big, big, um, physically fit announcer. And it was a, a, a kind of a parody of one of those um, huge voices, uh, you know, the ones who do the Oscars, you know, from you know from." from the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, you know, that sort of voice. And, uh, and so it was, uh, I can, I can remember it to this day. It was late 1972 when your parents probably weren't even born. And, uh, um, I can still remember, I, I, I had to say, uh, Hanna-Barbera super animation solves communication problems. 
And it was almost like Gary Owens, who used to be the announcer on Laughing with his hand on his ear saying, from beautiful downtown Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was the first one. And then um, after that, uh, it just, like a lot of young people who get into that, it took a you know another three years before I had anything like regular work because then you've got to, two things are against you. You, you 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 look so young that a lot of the um, people in advertising then said oh he, he couldn't possibly do all these voices and then the other thing was you just have to get your name around a whole country and uh, uh in those days it used to involve um, you know a demo tape on actual reel to reel tape um that a lot of people used to walk the streets and go to each each uh, building where there was an ad agency or or a casting director and just hand physical copies of these little real tapes out and uh, they used to have shelves of all these actors voices in alphabetical order and uh, that was the way it was done in those days it was, it was uh, sort of like the old broadway actors who used to pound the pavements and knock on all the producers doors uh, <laughs> so so yeah you, but but then you finally start getting a few jobs and and like all things you know one thing leads to another they oh we wanted to use the guy who did that voice on this x product or whatever it was because that was a, a successful campaign. So bit by bit, you know, it just sort of builds up. And um, and I, I mean, you know, I, I was very conscious of keeping on practicing, even though I was starting to get work, because I wanted to get better and better at what I did and, and really improve the imaging of the characters. And that's one reason that I was able to do these international jobs where they eventually got me to do uh, all the Warner Brothers cartoons in, for my area of the world when they began expanding. And so... Uh, so uh, I got to do the rabbit, Mac. And uh, all of those sort of voices. And uh, and then I ended up, you know, being flown to Hollywood of all things, sort of like the old movie thing come true and, and doing this... Um, doing the voice of Bullwinkle in The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. And it's being produced by, of all people, Robert De Niro. So I'm, it's like I'm I'm you know starry-eyed all of a sudden because he he's playing a silly part in this movie so robert de niro is one of those uh really accomplished actors who often did um projects that that you know weren't normally a robert de niro type of role like in goodfellas or something like that um so that he could make money to do his serious jobs <laughs> so uh that was it was just one of those things where uh I ended up being, you know, the voice of Bullwinkle and uh, uh, the original guy who did his voice and was the chief writer was Bill Scott. And he died in, I guess, 1985. I knew him very well and uh, absolutely no relation. And everyone has assumed that I'm his son or, or his nephew or something. And, I, and there's no <laughs> relationship at all. <laughs> so, uh, but there, but he, he, he used to jokingly say, you know, when I'm gone, he said, boy, you're going to get the Bullwinkle voice. And, uh, and that's what happened. That's what I did. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that. That really, again, is one of my long con convoluted answers to your question about the the first job I ever did. Yeah, it's vivid in my mind. <laughs> awesome. awesome. So now, um, in the seventies, you provide voiceover for many radio and TV commercials by either doing impressions or original voices. Can you talk a bit mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, well, in those days, again, it was, um, I suppose, today, you you know, you think of characters like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and um, um, even more recent ones who've been in the uh, all the, you know, superhero type films. Uh, back in those days, because uh, TV hadn't even got, by the time I started, uh, we were three years away from even getting color TV. So that's how long ago it was. Um, but um, they used to run a ton of old movies on TV, like movies from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And um, they were known by every generation, whereas these days it's sort of like fragmented generations. Like, uh, um, so grandparents and little kids all knew the same actors. So I used to get a ton of calls on these uh, either radio or TV spots, and they wanted to do a, a, <laughs> an impression of some... Do you do you guys know John Wayne? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, right. yeah. The uh, <laughs> excuse me, the cowboy actor. Yeah. Oh yeah. So He's you know, the, actor, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they do those sort of genre, uh, 
parodies in some of these um, commercials, like a like a scene from a cowboy film or something. And so I'd have to I'd have to do a John Wayne voice, and then they they they'd also cast me as uh, his offsider. So you you end up doing that sort of thing where you're talking to yourself, you know. And it was like, uh, yeah, one of these old timers sort of characters like this, and you know. Well, that's what we're going to do. And it was all related to some product or something. I used to do tons of things like that. And uh, that was really about the first 20 years I was doing it before the original legend voices started dying of just of old age. So I wasn't even doing any of the matching of famous uh, animation characters back then. But they did, along with the commercials you asked about, there was... Um, there was a nascent cartoon industry beginning here in Australia uh, with a Polish immigrant, uh, an older man who's no longer with us called Joram Gross. And he came from Poland to Australia and ended up doing these, ended up really doing a lot of made for TV cartoon series of like, you know, 60 episodes each. And the most famous one was this Australian literary property that was around since like the 1920s, but it was about a koala bear and it was called Blinky Bill. And uh, that eventually ended up being the first animated TV series he did in Australia. And myself and a lady named Robin Moore uh, ended up doing all the voices on that because back in those days, we were the ones most known for doing character voices instead of just like straight announcers doing just their own voice their whole career. Um, so I was ending up in these made for Australia cartoons, which you can now source on the internet, um, uh, you know, doing kangaroos and platypuses and all these native Australian animals in cartoon form. And um, so that was a lot of work. Uh, that also went for like 20 years, along with the, the commercials, because there were series after series. He did a, a series based on, you know, the dolphin flipper, was called oh, yeah. Flipper and Parker, and there were three series of that. And yeah. I was doing all oh, by that stage. It was you know like the villain was a this this mad doctor octopus character under the water who wanted to take over the whole island. And and so I I ended up doing in the audition for that. I did a kind of a Jack Nicholson crazy Jack Nicholson voice, and they caricatured it to almost look like Jack Nicholson's face and. Uh, so I got that kind of part in that, and he was just this crazy, crazy villain, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it's just been a life of all this zany uh, voices like that, you know, that uh, built up. But uh, yeah, really, that was that was it. A lot of it was day to day work. Uh, you'd get a call, and uh, you you'd go in, and you wouldn't even know until you saw the script what they were going to do. It was. Uh, uh, because there wasn't any um, instant communication like like the mobile phones and the internet of today, often it would have been too much, you know, to mail something to your house in advance. And and it was just a lot of it was just like they'd write something the day before and say, oh, these guys who are experts, they'll know what to do. And so you'd turn up, and we used to love that as as uh, performers because it was a challenge to be creative. It was like you were thinking on your feet and creating on the spot, and they'd say, we want to um a villainous character for this guy and this one is like a pure superhero type and uh uh or some of the girls would get uh this this is a real um old um battle axe of a a, a woman who's yelling at these guys and so you'd, you'd come up with a lot of it was cartoony sort of characters but uh you were really thinking uh on your feet and uh your brain was in, it was sort of like what they'd call instant interpretation you'd be handed something cold and if you were really experienced at it, you'd end up also getting a lot of work because you were in and out of the studio fairly quickly and onto another one, which saved them money. You know, um, you, you'd think of whatever a studio might have cost back then, say 200 bucks an hour or something. If if you weren't quick and you made them um, go over the hour, they're, they, you know, they're paying an extra 200 bucks, whatever the equivalent of that is today, it'd be a lot more. So yeah, that's uh, that was that was a kind of like a lot of what the day to day work was like back then. Really hasn't changed either. I'm sure it's the same now. You know, for any young folk getting into it. Right. And before we continue with the next question, here is our other co-host, uh, Matt Vingle. Hello, Matt. How are you? I'm Keith. I'm doing good, Keith. How are you? Good. 
Not too bad at all. Oh, it's terrific. Good. Terrific. Terrific. So, how, how are you, Matt? I'm good, Jakey. Yes. I'm glad, glad, to be, glad to be here. Yes. Happy I made it. Yes. Yeah, so to continue this, so you've also uh, made many appearances on TV shows as a comic impressionist. Can you share any of those right. experiences? Well, really, that's that's uh, back in the days when they had what they call variety shows. I think uh, it's pretty rare to see it on TV these days. Um, but uh, back then, it was quite common. To, you you were either a straight stand up comic or a comedy impressionist, and uh, I, I fell into the latter category. And there were these crazy shows. Uh, remember, there was an Australian one called Hey, Hey, It's Saturday, which was very uh, irreverent. Oh, yeah. And right. yeah, and anything goes sort of thing, you know. Um, again, a little ahead, ahead of its time. It sort of came along around about the time of The Simpsons, and there was just this change in humor of the whole world over, you know, from comedy clubs and things began appearing. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, uh, uh, back then, apart from local um, political characters and 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 TV personalities, I'd be doing some you know famous American ones at at that time. I remember doing you know President Ronald Reagan, uh, as I said to uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, you know, and all all stuff like this that that you know would be very topical back then but of course topical humor is one of the worst things of all because it dates so quickly there a lot of comedians who did voices like that would uh, recycle certain jokes because politicians are always the same no matter which new ones come along you know so so of course yeah around about the uh the end of the period just about the beginning of the pandemic when COVID hit uh we were all having we were all having a lot of fun with Donald Trump because even then he was still the president <laughs> and doing all of this sort of crazy stuff. And uh, and now it's the same again, I suppose, with, with Joe Biden because, um, you know, it's almost like shooting fish in a barrel, you know, with the, with him because uh, you, you can get a bit, a bit un, unintentionally cruel because of his age, I think. It was like, uh, I'm, I, want, I want to be clear. Where am I? <laughs> have him falling asleep every sentence <laughs> so uh yeah it was like pretty much just that sort of thing but i i would do um i mean there's there's bits and pieces you can see on my um on my website of the the stuff that i would do uh, i think there's even a clip from way back in the 80s um of me doing a bunch of cartoon voices in front of a live audience one straight after the other and uh and that was a routine that uh people kept asking me to do because it was unusual you know it was real rapid rapid fire voice changes and um, just real nonsense of course it didn't make any point but uh often that was the sort of comedy people wanted on tv in those days just uh, just something silly zany funny and it didn't have to be uh making any sort of political points uh, I think the world has now moved so fast uh, with uh, w what's happening these days that it's it's more expected that you're going to you know comment on current events rather than just nonsense. But uh, comedy's always evolving anyway. But uh, yeah, it was pretty much just like uh, if you can ever rem remember seeing any of those guys who did you know quick voice changes on TV in a stand-up sort of a role, or you know you'd still see them at comedy clubs. Um, that was pretty much what I was doing in those days as the adjunct to my other anonymous career of doing voiceover work. So Definitely. it's just been this, 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 um, this set of tonsils of mine that's been worked, worked to the bone, uh, for 45 years doing all this nonsense and zany stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you've also done a bunch of stand up shows at different corporate events. Can you talk a bit mm -hmm. about doing that? Yeah, the corporate the corporate field for a while, uh, it, it's almost a bit dated now. I don't I, I, unless they get young comics, the corporate field events tend tend to have a certain age group. Uh, and of course, I was that much younger back then when it all started because it it was a burgeoning field back then. There was uh, a lot of comedians would be hired because they'd have some event, whether it was an awards night, some black tie, you know, big get together. A client meeting. Sometimes you'd you'd uh, you'd you'd lump the term corporate into so many offshoots. Uh, there'd be a little 
sales meeting of 20 people in some room with just drinks, no, no seats or anything, everyone just standing. And they'd still want a little bit of entertainment at these things. So they'd either get a comedian or a, or a mimic like myself. Um, or it could be one of those big, important black tie nights where everyone from every state congregates in, say, Sydney at a big ballroom and uh, they're all dressed to the nines and um, it's a big three-course dinner type thing. So, you know, the, the the term corporate really does encompass all of that uh, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's just a generic term, really, for anything that's not a show for the general public, like in a club, you know, um, but it, more of a business-oriented thing. And yet you're still, you're still dealing with people who in their private life would be going to a club anyway with their family. So it's, it's uh, you didn't, the only thing is occasionally on those things, they'd ask you to tailor something in your show and mention some of the people there. And I used to find that that was counterproductive, really. Uh, you know, they they would think it would be a great joke and they'd give you a list of maybe 20 people who worked there and they'd say, now this guy is fat and this guy is a real, um, you know, he he um, thinks he's a ladies' man and all of that. And, of course, these days, uh, you'd, you know, you've got to be watch out because of the, you know, all, all the changes that have come along since then, um, that you, you know, you could literally offend somebody. Uh, the humor back then was pretty raw, <laughs> but I used to find that that didn't work because, um, it was obvious that you didn't know these people, whereas they all knew them. They were, they saw them every day of their working life. And you had to be pretty careful that what these guys assumed you were going to say something really funny about their friends who'd get, then get a big laugh. I heard about a lot of comedians who did that and uh, they'd do something and the person got really offended, you know, and, and embarrassed and, and his family was there and they got embarrassed. And, and, and these guys had, had originally thought it was going to be, Oh, this hilarious, you know, we'll make fun of his weight or something like this, you know? So uh, I very quickly learned uh, to say no to that and say, listen, I'll say something that I'll, I'll work out. That's very harmless and still, you know, we'll get a bit of a giggle. And, um, uh, but uh, mostly I just said, look, I, I'm, I'm, I prefer just to do my own, you know, and mostly on corporate things also, they only wanted like 20 minutes because it was the best time of night strategically for your performance would be going on straight after the main course of the dinner before they got too drunk, you know, <laughs> So uh, it had its advantages and its disadvantages. The, the advantage of corporate work was that it paid much better than normal clubs. Uh, the disadvantage was all of those other things I just mentioned. Um, sometimes you could uh, you could be reported unfavorably just because one person might have taken offense at something you said about their product or something, right. and you meant it as a harmless joke. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's... Uh, I'm in a, I'm in not in a soundproof studio, so that that'll ring for a couple of minutes, and then you'll. I did a bullwinkle voice on the answer machine to to, to ward off telemarketers. It's an old landline. Uh, I like that. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> nice. And no worries. We don't really hear it as much. No, so. uh, we don't. We don't really yes, hear yes. it. So you're good. You're well, I just the, the tag of it. If you can hear him in the background, is bullwinkle saying. Um, if you're a member of the family or a friend, kindly leave a message. If you're a telemarketer, kindly take a hike. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you can just hear now. It's beep, 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 beep. So obviously I've offended some telemarketer. <laughs> so for many years, you worked on a number of projects in the Blinky Bill franchise, voicing Flat the Platypus, Lodge the Kangaroo, and various others. Now, mm -hmm. Us Americans, we may not be, I, I'm familiar with it, but maybe yeah. most of our audience isn't familiar with the Blinky Bill franchise. Could you kind of describe right. what it was about and what that was like for you? It was great. I mean, it was, it was the as I say, it was the Yoram Gross Studios' first foray into television. They'd done, they'd done about uh, four or five feature-length animated films using this technique uh, that he kind of... Um, uh, really i guess he invented it it was like live action backgrounds but the animated characters performed against for the whole film that that was done away with once it went to tv because then uh it uh, it was just like normal looking cartoon it had um, you know hand painted backgrounds and uh, and so on but anyway it was a, it was this famous book 
from way back in the 20s, The Adventures of Blinky Bill, about a mischievous koala, like a naughty little boy, I guess. But uh, it was like a traditional animation thing, uh, very much to do with just Australian stuff back then. I think, when did the, the internet really began? I guess you could say very late 90s, uh, maybe mid 90s. So this, again, preceded that by about five years. So again, there was... It was most unusual for any international, uh, unless they picked it up and played it, you know. Australia wasn't as as easily contactable back in the days of, you know, pre-Zoom and all everything that you've, we've got these days. Um, but somebody said that, uh, at least in California, I think it was played on a couple of local stations that used to get uh, content from all over the world. And... Uh, it built up kind of a cult following because what I did with those cartoons was uh, I knew it. a lot of his stuff was aimed at the very young, you know, like the ages from, say, six to 12. That was the intended age group of all of his series. Um, it was always, you know, shown after school hours in the afternoon. But I knew a lot of parents were watching. And from my experience when I was a kid, I remembered, you know, getting frustrated when I used to love Rocky and Bullwinkle, but my mother would be in the same room, either ironing clothes or doing something. And she'd be laughing at jokes that I didn't get. So that really frustrated me knowing that I had to wait a few years to really get all the humor uh, because it was just aimed, you know, a couple of things were just aimed at the adults just to go over the heads of the little kids. The kids were enjoying the adventure aspect, but uh, uh, so I, I, tried with a lot of the voices uh not just the regular ones like the kangaroo and the and the platypus but any one-off characters that appeared in just one episode i tried to do impersonations of voices that would be recognized or, or funny to the parents i remember in one there was uh three villains and uh, i did one of them as a local politician and the other two i did do as as uh, schwarzenegger and and Sylvester Stallone just because they were really hot at that time in the movies and uh, so one was a very you know big beefy looking I think it was a like a bull maybe and so I gave him a voice like Sylvester Stallone you know All right, yeah. and the other one uh, another big big character was like uh, Arnold you know it's like uh, go get get to the chopper now and uh, all this, and uh, the other one was just a little tiny rat, and I did him as the um, prime minister of Australia, you know, <laughs> like a politician. And the kids wouldn't have known; they just thought they were funny voices. But uh, you, I used to get a lot of mail from the parents saying, "We we enjoy your uh, little contributions because it uh, we can happily watch the cartoons with our kids and have a few laughs for ourselves." So that became my my philosophy for uh, the twenty or so years I was with that studio here um, to do. Uh, something for the old older part of the audience who'd be accompanying the little kids that it was aimed at you know so uh yeah that 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 uh i mean i remember in uh the the platypus had this duck bill that's what they, they look like and so i gave it like an australian version of daffy duck where he couldn't you know pronounce the s without uh, that that lisp well it sounded sort of like an australian version of daffy duck and um, and the kangaroo was again based on a politician who couldn't pronounce the letter R properly, um, like he talked about. Uh, instead of saying radical free market reform, he'd go radical free market reform. Well, I made that big tall kangaroo. I just exaggerated that voice and I made him made him a little bit like that. Oh, come on, Blinky, we're going down to the crocodile farm. You know, so. I, you know, I'd take anything in, in popular culture like comics do right now, you know, and uh, it would be just fodder for making a funny character voice out of, you know. So uh, it was like like basically, uh, again, you'd, until you turn up to a, a, a session for a, a half hour cartoon like that, you don't really know on the first episode what it's going to be like. But those characters um, are usually worked out for a couple of recording sessions where where you're auditioning. And then the director will say, just add this to it or take that little bit out. So that they're kind of set by the time you actually start production uh, and they don't alter, you know, like three, three or four episodes later, they're kind of set from the beginning. You know, in the, in the old days of um, 
the famous cartoons like uh, Bugs Bunny, you can, if you watch them chronologically, uh, you can hear the early Bugs. Uh, it was kind of a lot, uh, a lot more uh, subdued and uh, kind of a tough little stinker like that. And then, then later on, it became the mm, yeah, what's up, Doc? You know, so uh, they they developed uh, even Bullwinkle when he started. He was uh, a lot lower and uh, a lot less energetic. And then he became the Bullwinkle that we all know. <laughs> so uh, they do, you know, they did change slightly until they settled in. But these days, a, a lot of the uh, series uh, worked out pretty much from the start so they and the same with advertising you know the the you tend to have so many committees there who'll sit in on an audition and they all have their two cents worth to throw in so you do end up with a character that pretty much stays the same i'm thinking about some of those old days where um the great doors butler did uh those captain crunch commercials for the cereal you know and they went for like 25 years and that voice didn't vary from commercial one right up to the end when he passed away. So, uh, oh. yeah, it really was uh, like a, a lot of uh, experimentation. Definitely. Sometimes, yeah, and sometimes you might use like a, a, a movie star voice and then exaggerate. I remember there was a, a series we did called Tabaluga about a, a, a little dragon. I think that was a German literary property originally uh, because by that time in the last 10 years of that studio here they were all co-productions or they called them co-pros where where they'd be um getting funding from europe uh, so they'd be either german or french co-productions with australian animation and uh so one of them had a, a villainous snowman and and he, he had a little offsider that they had called james in the script and uh and so the the old guy Yoram Gross said, "Just do James Mason, you know." So James James Mason had this sort of a voice, and he was a a very distinguished old English actor. And of course, suddenly it became a very funny little voice for a tiny little penguin cartoon character that was very um, obsequious and sort of, uh, "Oh yes, oh yes, Your Majesty, of course I'll 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 immediately go and do that for you." Don't beat me. No, 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 no. I'll do. So, you know, what what was a serious actor in films <laughs> ended up becoming this zany little character in, in the cartoon using this very distinguished voice. And it became a, a funny uh, contrast, if you know what I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, going back to uh, Bullwinkle J. Moose, as you mentioned, you were uh, mm -hmm. his voice actor for uh, 20 years. What was it like right. getting to... Uh work on the adventures of rocky and bullwinkle movie well that that i guess that's like the dream of anyone uh in in showbiz like myself you you know you never think it's going to happen but uh first of all it was the the thing that got me interested in when i was a six-year-old in in doing voices rocky and bullwinkle and all the jay ward productions cartoons um i used to love the fractured fairy tales and dudley do right the crazy you know mounty canadian mm -hmm. mounty and uh, so I was doing all of those those characters, never dreaming that I'd end up not only as the voice of them, but being flown to Hollywood. It's sort of like a, one of those old movies where where you know the the actor gets sick on opening night and and the young uh, understudy takes over the role and becomes a star. For a little while there, I was a I was getting all this international work and and uh, and then one thing leads to another. They they flew me to Canada to do the voice of. Uh, after that movie it was the voice of diesel the the villainous train in the thomas the tank engine thing and um that would that one didn't work out that was like one of those situations where i did this 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 whole thing they flew me to toronto to record it uh and uh they had a test screening this is like in the year 2000 i think and uh apparently the villain i did scared all the little kids so that i got fired from that job <laughs> And they got somebody else. I don't know. I don't know how you make a villain less scary, but but somebody must have. But I I mean I based the voice on the old Disney cartoon from way back in the thirties, Three Little Pigs, and the big bad wolf had this. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. You know, and that's all I did. But uh, you know, <laughs> now they're saying the kids got got uh, scared at the preview, so maybe they had kids of like three or four there. 
<laughs> I don't know. I mean, really, before Rocky and Bullwinkle, even though that was such a uh, a great experience for me, uh, the the first one that they flew me to Hollywood to do was narrating the first George of the Jungle with Brendan Fraser, who uh, has made a huge comeback. I mean, he just won an Oscar, I think. Uh, um, but uh, if you saw that film, uh, that was based on this very short run J Ward series from 1967, George of the jungle with super chicken and Tom slick. It was only, I think they only did 17 half hours, uh, but each of them was narrated by an actor called Paul freeze, who had a great Orson Welles sort of a voice. <clears throat> and it was like, uh, um, I'm the mighty Bomba shooty Valley in Mwebwe province in Africa. George of the jungle and the and of course he had died by then and they and she asked if I would like to narrate the movie in his voice and so that I always remember you know auditioning for it by the technology then I think was 1997 it was called ISDN it was it preceded zoom but it was basically uh, they'd perfected uh the fact that you could hook up 14,000 miles from Sydney to uh, Los Angeles, uh, audio only. And uh, it sounded like you were in the same room, you know, so uh, that became a commonplace thing. Now, I think that was the beginning of where globalizing the industry really started back then, you know, because uh, you could go anywhere in the world or at least the English speaking world, if you're talking about cartoons and, and, share the talent from england or new zealand or america or wherever it might be canada um so the george of the jungle I, I remember doing that one and the 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 live action with brendan fraser was the same as the opening of the old george of the jungle tv cartoon because the song was you know watch out for that tree as he's doing the tarzan sort of uh, 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 and he slams head first into these trees because he's such a klutz and uh I love the opening line in my narration of that first movie because it was like, uh, and this is George of the and you see him swinging and you just know he's going to head face first into this gigantic tree and he's doing that scream. And I say, he is swift. He is strong. He is sure. Crash. And he falls unconscious. He is unconscious. <laughs> so that was... Uh, <laughs> And, and the other the other bit I loved in that movie was where they uh, they they really captured the Jay Ward sort of humor um, really well in just this bit where these two animal poachers who were the villains um, I'm I'm describing them and you, know, you can hear my my disembodied voice saying these mean sneaky animal poachers and one of the guys a big chubby guy looks up to the sky and says stop calling me that you know <laughs> so I will not. So it was like this breaking the breaking this wall of of a narrator from somewhere up above in the sky. <laughs> They're hearing him in the movie. I mean, just so silly, but uh, but such good fun, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So you also got to voice Popeye and Bluto for the Universal ride. Popeye uh -huh. and Bluto's Oige Rat Barges. Yes, try yes. seeing that five times fast. <laughs> what was that like? Gee, it's that now that's a while ago because uh at in those days the Jay Ward characters like Bullwinkle and George of the Jungle, everything, they were being licensed for a few years by Universal Studios. And uh that at that same time they'd opened this big theme park in Florida. Um to try and match what Universal in Hollywood was like, you know, whether you, you go on the studio tour and all of that. But in Florida, they had even more intricate rides. And it was really around about 1997, 98, the beginning of the modern technology where rides were real experiences. And uh, and so they tried to get the, you know, as close as they could to the original voices for people who could remember the old black and white Max Fleischer Popeye cartoons, which were really grungy and sort of street smart, you know, way ahead of, uh, I guess, pre-code cartoons, you know. Uh, some of the some of the jokes in them you couldn't get away with today because they were outrageous, you know. But uh, I do remember I had always done a Popeye voice, and they were always looking for people who could do Popeye because it 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 was a tough voice to maintain, or you'd you'd have to do it in separate takes because uh, 
and have a, a sip of water between. But it was like, uh, I love you, Olive, you know, and um, <laughs> um, but but women is always bad luck on a, on a cruise ship. Ah, bah, 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 bah. And uh, and the old Bluto was this huge guy with the like a he had a bass singer doing his voice, and uh, so he was sort of like, uh, well, you why you dirty little fool take that why I oughta. and so it was like uh, I had to jump from one of those voices to the other for this ride. Uh, unfortunately, I I, I think this, those rides still exist. I, at the same session I was doing, there was a Dudley Do Right ride i think it was called ripsaw falls or something and and of course these were like miniature adventures you're on the ride and the cartoon characters are doing something as you know as you're watching and so uh along with the popeye voice and the bluto i was doing dudley do right of the mounties you know and uh and there was also one with boris and bullwinkle so it was again all these offshoots of doing the 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 film um Gee, I think June, the late June Foray and myself used to work a lot where she was the oldest actor left from that generation. She was still doing Rocky and Natasha in those days. And I got to work with her a lot. And that, that again, that's a thrill because you're working with one of the, the legends you grew up listening to. And uh, we ended up doing not only all those rides in, in theme parks, but uh, gee, voices for slot machines in las vegas and all these little offshoots that you don't think of you know that uh, the characters can be used on so uh it really was a great ride while it lasted then 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 the characters i guess they kind of fell out of favor when a new generation was born and grew up because there was all these new characters and cartoons coming along that uh and for for a while there i think uh well certainly before youtube uh that generation that I grew up with, like Bugs Bunny and all those things, fell out of view unless you bought DVD collections. They just weren't on TV anywhere for a long time. Now I guess they're back on MeTV and those things, but uh, uh, and they and now now they've also discovered how to restore these old 1930s cartoons so that they look brand new, which is great. Um, so uh, you know, then along comes a generation of cartoons for really tiny kids like dora the explorer and you think okay i've been in this business a long time i don't think i'm going to start working on these voices <laughs> and they just wouldn't suit me at all <laughs> but that's yeah. just the way the business goes you right know, it's always reinventing exactly absolutely yeah. so on the subject of rides and attractions you also got to voice a number of the looney tunes characters for various oh, yeah. attractions what were those like that was great because, uh, again, uh, with the parents and grandparents who attended with kids, they all grew up with these cartoons in theatres even before television came along. And so uh, it was great doing those ones because they were so famous. They're now legendary, you know, and uh, I, I'd be doing well, a lot of those were, were those sort of theme parks that you go to. And then there's a theatre and, and they would have uh, I guess they still do this. It's a big time thing uh i did about 20 years of this too it was uh for the hannah barbera characters and for the warner brothers characters where you do all the voice track and it was like a an adventure or something on stage and it was performed by by all these dancers who'd get up in costumes of huckleberry hound or bugs bunny or whatever it was tweety and sylvester and it'd be like 500 people in this theater you know from little kids to their parents um watching these productions my my part of it ended months earlier because i was just on the soundtrack of it all but you'd be singing and you'd be doing all this shtick back and forth with the uh, you know sylvester like what from what attach of course you had to do it pretty loudly and and broadly because you were doing it for a live presentation in a in a big theater with a huge audience so it had to be just as crazy and broad as the the old cartoons to, to reach everyone, you know, and it also had to be just paced slightly slower than normal because uh, if you did it at the, at the crazy pace of a, of a cartoon, a lot of it would get lost because of uh, people laughing and you'd miss the next line. So mm -hmm. you learned how to time it for that medium. It was just a, a different discipline slightly, but it was still, the, it had to still sound exactly like uh, Sylvester or, uh, or, uh, or, or Bugs Bunny. Uh, or, yeah. 
Right. Yep, yep. So you also got to provide the voice, speaking of voices, for Homer Simpson for the Simpsons live on stage at Dream World. For you American Boy. viewers, Dream World is like Australia's yes. big theme park. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. I did I I'd forgotten that I even did that, but it was because um they approved I think on some demo I, I had, there was just me just doing a little bit of uh, a little bit of homey Simpson, and uh, and they said, yeah, no, we'll approve that guy to do it down under. You know, uh, you had to make sure that you went to every channel. I remember also doing something for uh, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble, and and that was DreamWorks. Then were licensing that, so they had to approve me. Then when Shrek came along, uh, I had to do Shrek and Donkey. Um, I remember. Uh, it took a while to get Shrek, you know, because it was like uh, this Scottish thing, and I kept defaulting into doing Billy Connolly for some reason. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but Eddie Murphy was was a, a good one because uh, uh, the character he did in that was so mimicable um, that um, it was like uh, what was the line where he said, uh, "You know, I really like you, Shrek," you know. <laughs> uh, you're a mean green fat machine. Together, we're going to scare the spit out of anybody that crosses us. <laughs> you know, um, and um, so he was a great one to do. But now I find that, like, uh, with your generation, you guys um, have grown up with so much media because of the internet and, and all of this, that now there's people that are all around the world who can do Homer Simpson and, and uh, often do it better than some of the actors because they've studied it so long. It's, it's sort of like... Uh, um, it's just the way things progress, I guess. It's just technology. But uh, it's just been really interesting to somebody like me that uh, it, it used to be so anonymous and so mysterious to people, and now everyone knows about voiceovers and things, you know. So right. it's, it's uh, yeah. It, the, but, yeah, that just that, that uh, quick thing with the Homer thing was uh, he actually didn't really have that many lines from memory because a lot of it was just songs, you know, and, again, aiming at that younger demographic a lot of it is just that sort of where you have a live host with the characters in their costumes next to them and they're all singing and dancing and doing all this sort of stuff um they're a kind of corny thing in one sense but that's because they're dealing with kids of three and four who are accompanying their parents at the park so it's like that's who it's aimed at you know um so you just go with the flow and and you do it and uh, it would be interesting to see a, a real i think the best thing i ever saw on a live stage about the Simpsons was that guy who could do every voice and he was touring the world, you know, doing Shakespeare or say a Shakespearean play with every voice. Like he did Homer and Marge and Bart and all. <laughs> I can't think of his name, but it was quite funny, <laughs> but it was definitely for an adult audience or it was actually really for, for actors because it was very much a, a, a theater piece, you know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, Moving on from voice acting, in 2000, you published your first book, The Moose yes. That Roared. Uh, could you right. kind of talk about what the book's about? Well, that, that book is the entire history of J. Ward Productions. I mean, you know, Bullwinkle's on the cover because he, he definitely was their most famous character. But uh, um, it was something that I, again, um, I, I've always been a... a really serious researcher of old films and old time radio and all these topics. And uh, when I got to know all my heroes like Bill Scott and Doris Butler and all these people, um, they all said, gee, you, you know so much about this, this, this stuff that we've done that we've forgotten. Uh, and Bill Scott said, gee, one day I predict you'll write a book about us. Well, he died in 1985, but, but, I was, you know, uh, when he said that, I was only like 19 or 20, and I, I was thinking, what's he talking about? I could never do that, but I did. <laughs> you know, yep. back, back, you know, in my late 40s, I published the book, and, and it, apparently uh, it's it's more popular now, strangely enough, with cartoon buffs than than I had even thought it would be if, uh, if it was a good book, um, because it was published in the year 2000, as you said, and it was deliberately timed to coincide with when the movie, The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, opened, 
I think the publishing company got together with the movie people and said, this is a good marketing thing. We can have the book come out, you know. Um, so that, that all worked out really well. Uh, unfortunately, the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie kind of tanked a bit. Um, one problem was that the the original guys who sponsored the cartoons from back in the 60s was a cereal company, General Mills, you know, Cheerios and all these cereals. And um, they were not playing ball with Universal, who had the rights to the characters. They still owned the shows. So there was all this corporate bickering about money and all this. And so the cartoons hadn't been on TV for about, oh, 15 years when the movie came out. Um, they started to run a few of them on, I think, uh, Bravo or one of those uh, cable channels. Um but it wasn't enough because uh, the main uh, audience for you know national television uh, just hadn't seen. So the parents and the grandparents remembered them, but the kids had no idea who Rocky and Bullwinkle were when the movie came out, which was a real problem and a disappointment to us. It didn't do as well as it could have. Whereas the cartoons that had stayed on TV when they were made into movies like the Flintstones or Scooby-Doo, they were so successful that they ended up making sequel after sequel, you know, and uh, so there you go. It's just a, just a luck of the draw. <laughs> and yet it has become a kind of a little cult thing, you know, over the years since. So right. I can't complain too much. Yeah, so, George of the Jungle yeah. was, was really successful. Oh, yeah. And yet they, they didn't even know the cartoons. But I think, I think that song was so memorable george 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 of the jungle you know that everyone in the world would mm -hmm. walk out of the theater singing it you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh and also i think that just came along at a time and it was done by disney quite well with brendan fraser and oh, yeah. it just worked great yeah movie. yeah great movie so mind you mind you the sequel oh, <laughs> really <yeah>. sucked <laughs> yeah and oh, you fact, know as it is with most disney sequels yeah. you know yeah, well, it went straight to DVD. It didn't even go into theaters. Anymore. Yeah, a lot of the no yeah. shade to the people who worked on them, but a lot of the the right. direct to video sequels aren't the greatest. There, there's some good yeah. ones, but yeah. usually it's always the originals message. that people go back to. Oh, I knew when I was working on it because they got me back to narrate that one, and I was thinking, oh, this is not good. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and they could they couldn't get Brendan Fraser too. Like he was becoming quite big by then. He'd done films like Gods and Monsters and things like that, so he didn't want to repeat as George. Yeah, but uh, but anyway, it 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 you know, it's it's made its money back. Uh, I think I get a like a a residual check of like sixty cents every couple of years from the the sequel. <laughs> yeah. But the first one was a, was a big success, and strangely enough, uh, uh, that's what people remembered me for in, in Hollywood. Not not the Bullwinkle one, even though Bullwinkle was still a much more long running, remembered property. You know, right. So yeah. as we're kind of getting to the last questions here, recently you published mm -hmm. a new book all about the history of animation voices of the golden age. Oh, yes. How did that come about? Yes, this is uh, the book here. It's called Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age. And it's really, it's a study of something that was a hobby of mine for many, many years, researching my own field and going way back to the beginning of sound films. And it's really more of an historical book because it shows you how, voice acting for animation developed as an art form it started out where walt disney the most famous name in animation was the first ever cartoon voice of the very primitive mickey mouse when sound first came into films and for the so the book traces the development of of six major studios like disney warner brothers etc who did theatrical cartoons and how for the first three or four years of sound cartoons, all the voices were being done by the staff members. You know, they had no idea about hiring professional voice actors. Uh, it was just animators or background artists had come in and squeak and do a grunt for a mouse or something like that. So mind you, the gags were still pretty out there and funny in some of those early ones. But uh, <clears throat> then they slowly... Uh, began using singing groups uh, who were very practiced at doing character voices in song, uh, especially the bass singers who would who would uh, do good villains. Um, and then suddenly, like 1937, about nine years into sound films, they start using radio actors, and that was the year that Mel Blanc, who has still never been topped in the field, 
uh, became a voice at Warner Brothers and eventually their star voice. You know, he ended up doing Foghorn Leghorn and uh, all the uh, secondary characters that have become famous, Yosemite Sam, all these great voices. Um, and uh, so it really traces it from that point in the book. It talks about Mel Blanc and then Doris Butler and then Stan Freeberg and all these other great legendary names. But I also managed to do a lot of research at some of the archives where Warner Brothers donated all their papers, for instance, at uh, USC and uh, found a whole bunch of names of, of uncredited actors. Cause in those days, days you never saw the actor's name on the screen. And uh, so the, what I'm really proud of with this newer book is that I've uncovered about over a hundred people uh, who were anonymous until uh, I found out their names and and have identified them, and you know, if their family ever finds out, they might they might get a little glow of recognition. But it means nothing for people who died fifty years ago. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, it's a it's a it's a book that I'm glad I was able to do and complete. In fact, it was taking me thirty years to do it and research it because it was always a part time thing that one. And then when COVID came along and, and for the first year or so, I was just bound, housebound, couldn't travel, couldn't work in any clubs or anything. That's when I thought, oh, damn, I'm going to complete this book and get it off my mind, you know, or I'll never publish it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the last question that uh, Jake here is about to ask is a question we ask all of our guests at the end. Go ahead, Jake. Sure. Thank you, Chris. So, of course, this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia. There you go. Um, when right. you think of nostalgia... What do you think of, or in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia? Well, it's a huge thing for me because my whole life has been nostalgia. I, I was born in mid-century, and yet all of my interests go back to. Uh, I think I think I, I just fell in love with nostalgia because um, I there was a show when I was about ten years of age called Hollywood and and the Stars, it's about twenty six episodes, half hour. And each each episode covered a different topic, but it went right back to Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer, the first talkie film and all of that. And something snapped in me and I started collecting old movie books and things. I was just a kid. So that uh, unlike every other kid my age, I wasn't into sport or anything like that. I was just this, uh, I suppose I was, you know, the original super geek or super nerd who who loved all the nostalgic stuff. And uh, and I still look back and and and, and love that era things were probably a little more simple back then and not so technologically advanced so that uh, i think a, a lot of good stuff was done because they didn't have any of today's tools and they still managed to make really good uh, good good uh, entertainment so uh, yeah i'm i'm very big on nostalgia and uh, i don't i don't go along with that joke that joke that says nostalgia isn't what it used to be that my great word turned on Awesome. Well, thank you, Chris, Jake, and Matt. It's been a, a pleasure. And yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, very... thank you for taking your time to do this. You know, and, thank you. you know, thank you so much for what we've done no. over the years. You know, keep up the great work, and can I wait? What's, what's next in store for you? Ah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm. This is the first time I've used this little uh, plug-in USB mic. Was my voice clear on this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it was. Because I'm, I'm so non-technical that I was using the in-built mic on the computer, and it sounded a bit dull to me. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Uh -huh. All righty. Terrific. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I will chat with you guys at some point. I'm sure in the future, but uh, most yeah, definitely. Enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll let you know when this goes up. Terrific. And I'll uh, hit the leave button and say, uh, that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's goodbye from us as well, everybody. You absolutely enjoyed your time with Keith Scott. Uh, keep on yes, the lookout and, for more um, wonderful interviews coming your way. Link to his website will be included in the description yes. and uh, links to where you can purchase a copy of his books. Um, but yes, again, like I just said, keep on the lookout for more wonderful interviews coming your way. As always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye. 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 Yeah. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye. <laughs>